everyone, and welcome to ABC's Anesthesia. So again, we're doing a podcast and YouTube uh, video with Faith. Thanks so much, Faith, uh, for coming in and yeah, helping us out. Actually, Faith, could you tell a bit of the, tell us a bit about where you're at with your training and where where you are? I'm a fellow, and I'm my year is divided into retrieval and anesthetics. So I'm doing my retrieval Newcastle, the Hunter Retrieval Service, and anesthetics at Gosford. And nice. I've just come off night shift. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what is it that training teaches you to, you know, work with the least amount of sleep and all the stresses? Like your training program gets you to that point that you can work under any conditions, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, so let's get started. So essentially, I've got a case here of an 80-year-old male with a fractured neck of femur, so fractured knot, with Parkinson's disease. I've kept it pretty vague just to start with. What do you want to know on assessment? Uh, so Faith, just take two minutes. So Faith, that's about two minutes. Um, what, what do you reckon? What, what did you? What kind of things did you write down? So first of all, I wrote a, just an opening statement. Uh -huh. uh, an elderly high-risk patient with neurocognitive disease for uh -huh. emergency orthopedic surgery. Uh -huh. And then I broke up my page into history, examination, investigations, consult, and just the main issues on each of those headings. Yeah, good. We, Why don't we get started then? So, yeah, what, what do you yeah. want to know? So I want to know from the history, in addition to my usual anesthetic assessment, mm -hmm. regarding the neck of femur fracture, when it happened, how it happened, whether it was mechanical or um, other, and the type of fracture and any um, predicted complications of the surgery. With his Parkinson's disease, I'd like to know when it was diagnosed and the progression of his symptoms since his diagnosis, the severity and stability of the disease, including medications he's on for it, and um, the affected systems. So uh, in particular, any neurocognitive um, problems, including dementia or uh, that will affect capacity and consent. Um, respiratory disease, including recurrent pneumonias, aspiration risk, and um, with cardiac, the cardiac system level of postural hypertension, and also with the gastrointestinal system, whether he has symptomatic reflux. And I would also like to know what his under, I would seem as physiological reserve is pretty poor but i would making some further asking some further questions regarding that on examination i would uh, do a focus assessment on his airway and his cardiorespiratory examination looking for any evidence of concurrent chest infection and also a neurological uh, brief neurological examination to note um, the severity of his rigidity and what positions he's able to tolerate and with the investigations, I would um, ask for a full uh, battery of tests, but I'd be looking for a degree of anemia, renal function, any electrolyte abnormalities that could be corrected preoperatively, group and hold, and um, coagulation screen. And I'd be looking at the ECG for uh, any significant arrhythmias or ischemic changes. And finally, I would be consulting with various members of the team to form a, a multidisciplinary approach to this gentleman's management. And this would include the ortho geriatricians, uh, the orthopedics regarding, regarding timing of surgery, and also acute pain service to ideally get a fascia iliaca block in beforehand, and the patient's next of kin if he wasn't able to consent. That's really great. So I'll just just give you feedback on that, Faith. I, I really love what you did there because this is, I gave you such a broad question. And in real life, you'd have so many cues just from, you know, you've got the notes, you've got the EMR, you've got all these other things in front of you. And you pretty much, even though it was so broad, uh, you tackled each thing piece by piece and you went through it very systematically. So the things that I have written here are, you know, I do my trauma assessment, which was you talking about what exactly was going on. So I do that assessment, assess the fracture. I do the Parkinson's assessment, which, yep, severity stability of the disease. Um, and, and often it's associated with lots of other disease states. And so you were talking through that in your investigation as well as your history uh, and then other things that you picked up really well that you would again in real life 
have indications to this, but in this exam, I feel like you need to have this index of suspicion for things. You said things like, you know, age related disease with, you know, respiratory cardiac. And also you mentioned the fact that you'd want an ECG, because I think we both know that often fractured NOFs, whoever they are, present with atrial fibrillation and other arrhythmias. Mm -hmm. uh, so is there anything else that is often highlighted in these patients, uh, maybe when you get the history to you? In Parkinson's patients? Uh, uh, sorry, in, in NOF patients in general. Um, <laughs> Often the ortho Jerry's have, have already sorted this out. Whether they're on any anticoagulants. Yeah, good. <laughs> And and so often often these patients have an acute resuscitation plan as well. Oh, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which again, you you you'd get cues for that in the in real life. Good, good. So let's say that this patient uh, is not for resuscitation. Has some treatment limitations. Um, so not for inotropes, not for intubation, not for not for ICU, not for CPR. According to this a, acute resuscitation plan that's already been done uh, in in the previous few weeks and months. Uh, the functional status is very poor, so pretty much bed, bed, bed bound with limited mobility, uh, managed to get up and fall, however. The, it's an isolated fall, no loss of consciousness, and just the fractured knot. Mm -hmm. um, and looks like it was really a low velocity kind of fall, just, just off the bed, really. Parkinson's, uh, actually, we'll get to that. Um, and you, you're given an ECG, and you do see that the patient uh, has atrial fibrillation, uh, and it is on a PIXABAN. So a few things there. You also notice that the patient has a pretty severe um, spinal deformity called camptochomia. Have you heard of this? Or bent spine? Um, no, I haven't. Not that word, no. No, no, that's right. Bent spine syndrome. So he's got a really fixed flexion deformity of his neck as well. Okay. So a few things to take in there. But before we go on, what, what is Parkinson's disease? So Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder uh, that occurs due to an imbalance of neurotransmitters in the substantia nigra, resulting in a decrease in dopaminergic neurons and an increase in cholinergic activity. And this is characterized by um, bradykinesia, rigidity, arresting tremor, and postural hypertension. Mm -hmm. And it's typically in patients who are of an older age, and there's a multitude of systemic disorders which I, I mentioned previously. How do you treat Parkinson's? It can be treated pharmacologically or surgically. Uh, pharmacological management includes dopamine precursors such as levodopa, which is usually given in combination with a peripheral decarboxylase inhibitor. And um, there are other adjuncts that can be added into the treatment, including dopamine agonists, um, such as ramiprexol, and then there's um, other medications such as NM uh, NMDA receptor antagonists like amantadine. On your history, the patient or the patient's family does talk about the patient having um, a history of post-operative nausea or vomiting. What do you want to know? I want to know what the severity of this. So if it's just been a one-off occasion, or if it's happened after every anesthetic and how debilitating this post-op nausea vomiting was, mm -hmm. and if there was any sequelae associated with it, particularly any, evidence, uh, any episodes of aspiration. Yep. So you find out that the nausea vomiting was very severe, so it went on for over a day um, and was quite debilitating for the patient previously. Uh, and yes, yeah, just so, so it does seem severe. Um, how does this impact your anesthetic uh, in, in this context? I would be using... Uh, as for the um, uh, the APFEL criteria, I would um, be increasing my anti-emetic agents to help minimise this, uh, help minimise the further episodes. And um, so within this, I'll be minimising my use of opioids. If I were to do a general anaesthetic, I would consider TIVA. However, my preference would be to do a regional technique and um, therefore minimize any volatiles at all. And yep. I would use at least two agents intraoperatively, including dexamethasone and ondansetron, mm -hmm. um, and if available, domperidone. And I would also um, ensure that two agents were prescribed postoperatively, but I'd avoid the use of any dopamine 2 antagonists. What are the dopamine, dopaminergically active uh, antimedics or the anti-dopamine antimedics that you know of, that you would commonly use? Uh, there's uh, metoclopramide, um, prochlorperazine or stematil. Uh, any others? 
and um, Joe Peridol. Yeah, sounds good. So absolutely, you'd have to avoid all of these and do all the all your other techniques. So your preference would be a spinal anesthetic, is that right? Yes, if he was able to get into the position, and yeah. there were no and um, there were no other contraindications. That's right. So the patient is on a Pixaban. Yeah. How long do you want to wait? So this would depend on his renal function. He, this is um, a high risk bleeding case. So if he had normal renal function, then I would, he would have to be off it for two days, 48 hours with uh, renal dysfunction. Then that would be three days. Yep. So this patient has normal renal function. Uh, the patients come in, had the fracture today. You see them six hours later. Uh, what, what do you want to do? So he, I've uh, seen him six hours later. It's pretty good. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, uh, there are some considerations here because the risk of delaying surgery in hip fractures for greater than 48 hours um, has been shown to increase perioperative morbidity and mortality. Mm -hmm. And if we wait for 48 hours for the apixaban to wear off, then um, we are breaching that time frame. I would have a, a use a multidisciplinary approach to this and um, consider the merits of waiting for the reversal for the apixaban to wear off and do a spinal versus going ahead and doing a general anesthetic. Um, I would also speak with hematology to get their advice on whether we could shorten that window. Um, They've advised that they can't shorten the window. Uh, okay. The patient had their apixaban, let's say, that morning. Uh, so they took the apixaban in the morning, had a fracture. They come into hospital. And yeah, how, how long do you wait? Okay. If they took it that morning, we would have to wait for 48 hours. That, that 48 hours, I've heard a few different ranges for this. Um, where's that? Where's that forty-eight hours from? Is that your local guideline? Oh, this is from the um, New South Wales CEC guidelines, so um, Clinical Excellence Committee. Sounds good. I've seen, strangely enough, I've actually seen a real big range in these guidelines. So I know okay. some hospitals wait seventy-two hours for every, everything, uh, and then okay. just a Google search says tw you know twenty-four hours. Um, that's right. So let's say the pa the surgeons are happy to crack on whenever you want to. How long would you wait? <clears throat> so I would wait 48 hours for the apixaban to have cleared. Sounds good. Is there any benefit of operating within six hours? Yes. The benefits of going ahead earlier are um, reduced perioperative morbidity, mortality, 30-day mortality and reduced length of stay. Um, this has been from previous meta-analyses and there's been a big drive to not delay um, hip fracture surgery for longer than 48 hours. How about ex accelerated surgery? So I actually agree with you, less than 48 hours, you have all those benefits. How about accelerated surgery within six hours? Does that have anything? Oh, okay. Um, I think in principle, that does sound like there are benefits to that by further reducing the um, risk associated with prolonged stay in hospital and in, um, in improve post earlier mobilization post-operatively, reduced risk of um, hospital acquired infections, hypoxia, deep vein thrombosis. But on the other hand, that as on the proviso that the patient's been adequately worked up and optimized. Mm -hmm. I like your answer to that. So I'm just going through the relatively recent AAGBI hip fracture guidelines, and they do talk about accelerated surgery having no mortality benefit, but decreased post-op delirium um, and obviously length yes. of patient stay. But I, I feel like, you know, without knowing that information, your answer is so reasonable. You know, you're like saying obvious things that, you know, you know were, are clearly true about not having prolonged bed rest and all those things. So I think that's good. I think your approach to like I, I think everyone realizes that these are absolute risk benefit situations and at, at a certain point you just have to make a call about whether you're going to risk the um you know the the near actual technique with suboptimal time frames and you're right mm -hmm. i'll call the hematologist and go look what is the absolute increase in risk 12 hours uh post apixaban versus 24 and if it's small enough i think there's probably a reason to you know, go ahead. But as long as I'm within that 48, that still falls within guidelines. So I, 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 I like your answer for that. And I, I'd, I'd probably do something very similar. Um, okay, so let's say, 
as you're trying to um as you're trying to get information from the patient uh you find out that the patient has a medical power of attorney but they're unreachable for consent um what do you do uh first of all i determine if the patient had capacity to give consent uh, himself let's but, say no, no capacity quite okay, so, quite cognitively impaired so assuming he doesn't then i look to see if he had a, a next of kin listed unreachable or a close family friend mm -hmm. unreachable okay so in this instance uh, this is an emergency surgery uh, this is a, a, a life and um, certainly morbidity saving intervention. And I um, would go by the principle of um, doing the acting in the patient's best interests. And mm -hmm. I would um, discuss this with the team, but with the um, aim of going ahead with surgery. I mean, it, it is urgent, but let's say we've agreed that you can wait 12 to tw uh, 24 to 48 hours for this. Therefore, it doesn't, it's not as urgent as I need to rush through because it's rupture AAA regardless. Uh -huh. So what else, what other resources could you use? Uh, there is the state, um, I think it's the Guardian Tribunal. Yeah, that's right. Is that uh, the right name? <laughs> yeah, we, we call ours the Office of the Public Advocate. Um, okay, yeah. What, what do you ask them? What, what's, what's that about? So they are a point of call when you, in the situation when you don't have um, a legal representation or um, next of kin for your patient in front of you, and they act in that patient in the patient's um, interests. Yeah, absolutely. Um, have you had to call them before? I haven't actually. Uh, I've called them a couple of times, and, and yeah, it's 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 just a phone call, and they say, "Yeah, that sounds reasonable. Go ahead." Okay. <laughs> So anyway, uh, yeah, get them on speed dial, always a useful resource. Yes. Now, let's say, so this patient does have these treatment limitations. What do you, what do you want to do about those? So this is a situation that's commonly encountered, particularly in this type of surgery. And um, given that he's, for the procedure, he's likely to... Um, required to be intubated for a start so i would um discuss with the well ideally with the patient or his kin or next of kin or guardian that um we would be respecting those um advanced care directors but if there was any um demise in his condition under general anesthetic that was readily treatable that we would go ahead and treat that and that would include um intubation and um short-term uh, defibrillation but it certainly wouldn't be a prolonged um attempt to um assist, to perform life-sustaining measures and why is that so why you mentioned you know respecting the acute resuscitation plan but then we are it sounds like you are going to modify it so why is that okay yeah it's always it's a it's a, a question i've asked myself a lot to be honest and a lot of colleagues i work with yeah but i think it's because as you embark on general anesthetics and, and surgery you're putting that patient in um, an invasive environment you you are essentially rendering them unwell from the mere act of provision mm -hmm. of anesthesia and so at the very least we can reverse and with our drugs they're more likely to precipitate cardiovascular dysfunction respiratory compromise which are treatable with um you know short-term interventions so I think it's just reversing what we've induced and then, um, but not trying to perform any heroics. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's, that's right. Like, with the acute resuscitation plans often like ward based plans are very, you know, for most circumstances, but yeah, so, surgery and anesthesia, everything we do is resuscitation. So it makes no sense for that to translate to our environment, I guess. And yeah. So I remember actually the AAGBI had a really nice guideline, which just talked about suspend, modify, or continue. And so realistically, what we always do is we modify most of the time, like we rarely completely suspend it because uh -huh. it's there for a reason. And, you know, we get the feeling that look, uh, we're, we're going to go for quality of life. Quality of life may mean not doing anything, but it may mean limited resus, as, as you mentioned. And I think what most people say is exactly what you said. We do the intubation, we give inotropes, because that's, that's just balancing what we've done to the patient. Yeah, and if they do need defibrillation, we might do limited course of CPR and defib. Uh, but that may, you know, I can imagine the circumstance where that would be unreasonable as well if this patient had completely terrible quality of life. Uh, yeah. That's good. 
Now, just tell me, generally speaking, what are so? Actually, no. Let, let's let's crack on. Uh, you attempt the spinal and you attempt an epidural. You try everything, but you cannot get a neuraxial block uh, for this patient. The patient's reasonably able to cooperate with you, so was able to you know, get into the right position. Was able to communicate, and they're just just um yeah, they're they're reasonably okay with following instructions. Uh-huh. Now you, I, I didn't ask you this before. I've just mentioned the very severe fixed flexion of the neck. What what do you do yeah. for the airway exam in this patient? Uh, preoperatively, you mean? Yeah, preoperatively. Yeah. So I, I well, any airway examination, my I, I examine yeah. the patient looking for predictors of difficulty with bag mask ventilation, laryngoscopy, insertion of a super airway device super um and front of neck super, access super glottic super sorry yeah, yeah. my place no. night <laughs> <laughs> no you're, you're doing this, well uh, dysphasia <laughs> coming along <laughs> um, i was just thinking of this um this uh, this lma with like capes and wing, wings on it <laughs> right. super super lma <laughs> go, go on um, yeah and then there is a you know, number of standard tests which help um delineate that includes so i would routinely look for mouth opening uh, a thigh mental distance, neck flexion, jaw protrusion, and that's for sort of the anterior column model. And then um, looking to clear the neck mobility. And if a patient had any imaging at this stage, we'll be looking at um, a CT neck or a lateral neck X-ray, and also asking the patient if he, you know, with the previous anaesthetics, mm-hmm. if he's had any difficulties in trying to obtain um, the anaesthetic records for the intubation grade. Okay, that's good. So uh, the anesthetic records aren't present. The last anesthetic for this patient was, say, 50 years ago, uh, but the patient had none of this deformity at that stage. Um, the mouth opening is adequate, say, four centimeters. Um, Mal and Patty's a bit hard to assess uh, because of the angles. Uh, thorough mental distance, hard to assess because they've got the fixed neck flexion as well. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and as you know, the um, neck, neck has a fixed flexion deformity. Uh, jaw protrusion is is uh, say is is reasonably good. A jaw protrusion A. Uh, that's all you've got. What do you what do you want to do? Okay, uh, this is a relatively difficult situation. Um, and weighing to this, I would like to know what his aspiration risk is. But it is likely to be high if he has um, got They're severe well, Parkinson's. They're well fasted. If he's well fasted with no, and assuming he doesn't have any uh, risks of aspiration, no gourd, no um, paralytic ileus, mm-hmm. then um, the length of surgery wasn't anticipated to be very long, i.e. more than two hours, mm-hmm. then I would be happy to go ahead with a second generation LMA. I want, I want to, obviously, I can't show you the pictures, but this patient has the most pronounced fixed neck all right. So when you look at the patient, you go, wow, okay. this looks bad. Yeah. When you do that, that makes me think I, I'm <laughs> not so happy with a LMA. Here we go. And uh, yeah, that's like an ankylosing spondylitis kind of picture. It, that, that's what it looks like. Yeah. And in that case, I would change my airway plan, um, which given the patient's relatively cooperative, I would be planning to do an awake fiber optic intubation. Great. Tell me what you do for an awake fiber optic in this patient. Okay, so I would explain the procedure to the patient and obtain consent. I would ensure that I had an intravenous um, cannula in place that was patent and prefer put on my monitoring. It should be standard monitoring, potentially an art line with his cardiac history. And I prepare my drugs. And this would include glycopyrrolate for, um, as an anti-psychologog, which I would give at a dose of 200 mics IV, and then I would um, commence topicalization using 4% uh, lignocaine, four mils. Um, I would then bring the patient into the theater and have all my equipment prepared for the bronchoscope, having discussed the plan with my answer assistant, have the patient sat up, and I would um, find out what his best nostril was and to apply the nose using cofenocaine spray, so maximum of five sprays. I would have a pre-calculated a maximum dose for his lignocaine to a max of nine milligrams per kilo. Um, I would then use the mucosal atomizer device to the nasopharynx and the oropharynx and um, at a dose of using 2% lignocaine, say three to five mils of each. 
And then I would do a spray as you go technique. My endpoints being a change in his um, voice, looking for a hoarse voice and um, lack of gag reflex. And I would um, go through the glottis of my scope, withdraw the scope um, using a size 6.5 reinforced tube and connect up to my circuit, confirm ventilation with CO2 and chest ventilation. Do you use, do you use opioids at all? Oh, yeah, sorry, I, I didn't mention that. Yeah, my practice is to use a low dose Remy and fentanyl infusion. Uh, we'd start at a target control of three nanograms per mil and titrate to effect. You start at three, do you? Yeah. Nice. How, how, what do you expect the total dose is before you start? Do you have an idea of that? Of Remy fentanyl? Yeah. Well, how do you know enough is it adequate? Um, so I, I had titrate it to um, sedation and respiratory rate. So I want the patient awake, but relaxed, mm -hmm. um, response to verbal cues and aiming for a respiratory rate um, of less than 10. Yeah, sounds good. Hey, so I, 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 like, I like your approach to that um, in, in the sense of, you know, you quickly got through the preparation stuff and you went straight to glyco out of obviously off of opioid straight away which you which you did um and then just go straight into what are my max doses what's my approach and just no mess no fuss you know obviously there's a hard technique and you know there's so many ways this can go wrong but this is you speaking about it as sharply as possible and i think you went through that very quickly and effectively um now i, I don't use uh, target controlled remy fentanyl much um mm -hmm. And so I, I don't have a good indication of how much three nanograms per mil concentration is. Um, in my head, I thought, oh, is that a bit high for this 80-year-old fractured and off with cognitive difficulty? I, I'm not sure of that, but, you know, obviously, you, you know, check that out. I, I'm thinking that this yeah. is hard run 0 0.05 mics per kilo per minute, um, going up to 0.1 mics per kilo per minute. And that may be what this three nanograms per mil range is roughly, but mm -hmm. that, that's, the, that's the one thing I just uh, ask about. But that that's all gone well, let's say. And, and and also you offered some of the key pointers, which is, you know, I put the tube down, confirm end tidal, then give my uh, anesthetic doses. You know, you know, just literally, I, I feel like you hit a lot of the critical points in this process very efficiently and very well. So that was that was great. Okay, let's uh, let's keep going for this badness. So just um, let's say five ten minutes into your induction, uh, the patient sats, which were ninety five percent on about sixty percent. FI have now dropped to about 85, 85%. Uh, what do you do? Okay, this is a concerning situation. I would immediately increase my oxygen to 100% and I would scan the patient's the surgical field and the monitors for any other associated respiratory or hemodynamic changes. And I would um, ask the surgeons to stop, I presume they've already started. Yeah. Um, so there are a number of differentials that this could be, but high on my differentials list, this could be manifestation of aspiration, um, or, um, a drop in his cardiac output after induction of anesthesia. And I'd be looking to confirm this by, um, having a look at the patient, as I said, auscultating the lungs, um, feeling for the pulse. Mm -hmm. There are other serious differentials to include that, um, such as anaphylaxis, um, uh, tension in the thorax um, or even tube dislodgements and I'll do a systematic check from the machine to the patient looking for all causes of hypoxia in such as reduced FI2, hyperventilation, um, any cause of shunt. I mentioned aspiration bronchospasm could it also be um, acute pulmonary edema or atelectasis, all causes of dead space, reduced cardiac output um, or even um, uh, pulmonary embolism. I like your approach. You got to safety, you increased the FI, you increased your flows, you checked in, scanned your monitors, and you mentioned then very quickly a lot of the things you do, put onto the bag, auscultate the lungs. And so what you find is that um, you uh, all, all the monitors seem normal otherwise. The patient's blood pressure is supported by, say, five, uh, 2.5 to 5 milligrams an hour of aramine, heart rate's 80, blood pressure's 110. Uh, SATs have now improved as soon as you started bagging the patient and auscultation doesn't reveal too much, just a few kind of crackles at the bases, um, but nothing too significant. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and everything resolves um, as supported by, you know, just um, bagging the patient. What do, you, what do you reckon the cause of that was? So that's probably um, 
manifestation of atelectasis yes, and um, with the recruitment he's picked up. Beautiful. Um, so that that proceeds on. Uh, now you're getting to the point where the where the surgeons are about to put the put the um, uh, the prosthesis in. Uh, now, anything you want to talk about with the surgeons before that or during? Yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to know if they're, um, well, what exactly they are planning to do. I would have that discussion before starting. Yep. Um, but also if they are planning to, if this was an arthros arthroplasty, if they're planning to use any cement, which for a, a fraction of unlikeliness, it was a hemi-arthroplasty. Now they've they've told you because of the type of fracture it is they will have to do the hemiarthroplasty so they're going to use okay. cement. Okay, so this makes the case that more risky for um, cardiovascular instability with um, and cement implantation syndrome. And I'll be maintaining vigilance around this time of cementing. Okay, and what what do you mean by maintaining vigilance? Is there anything you do? Yeah, so um, I would do a couple of preventative uh, measures. So I'd have increased the FFI2. I'll keep it on 100%. If I were to be using nitrous, then I would turn off the nitrous at this stage. And I'd make sure that he was um, adequately fluid that um, resuscitated. Um, yeah, sounds good. Now, yeah. un unfortunately, at the time that this occurs, uh, you notice that the blood pressure on your art line trends down quite substantially to about 50 millimeters mercury. Um, okay. Uh, and the patient becomes tachycardic. Uh, what do you want to do? All right. A systolic of 50 is um, uh, essentially a crisis situation. I would quickly confirm the reading, again, scanning the patient, the monitors, the surgical field, um, and assuming and look at the level of the transducer. This was um, a true reading. I would be calling for help at this stage as well, asking the surgeons to stop. I would temporize the situation by giving a bolus of fluid, giving at least one milligram of aramine with that blood pressure. And I would be looking closely for my likely differentials, which include um, bleeding, uh, any other causes of drop in preload from um, drug effects to hypovolemia, anaphylaxis. Given it's happened at a time of um, cementing, I would be looking for um, features of cement um, implantation syndrome and I'll be looking carefully um, for a drop in cardiac output feeling for the pulse. Could be other signs of obstructive shock like um, again tension pneumothorax or even a rare but possible tamponade or he could have had a myocardial event such as a myocardial ischemic, ischemic event or um, and it developed an arrhythmia. Now, the reason I really like that answer is that you, you got through a lot quickly again so you know you put out a lot of assumptions uh, and a lot of expectations with, you know, I'm checking for this, I'm checking for that. And you just kept on going with that. But importantly, you got that out quite quickly. So it wasn't delaying time. Um, but let's say, uh, yeah, the, there isn't any other signs of anaphylaxis. There isn't signs of bleeding in the surgical field. Um, the, there's no signs of ST changes or, you know, things that would worry about myocardial ischemia. And most likely you're thinking that this is bone cement implantation syndrome. Um, first of all, what, what is that? So it's... Um... Uh, a syndrome whereby cement particles enter the pulmonary circulation and um, result in high pulmonary artery pressures and a resultant drop in um, left ventricular cardiac output. Mm -hmm. And um, the pathogenesis is thought either to be a SERS reaction um, with the cement particles themselves causing pulmonary uh, vasoconstriction or that um, it's manifestation of fat globules that coalesce with the cement that um, enter the pulmonary circulation. And it's also been implicated that um, with the present of shunts that it passes directly into the arterial circulation and overall um, manifesting in cardiovascular instability and collapse. Now, th th that's very good. Now, as we move on with the scenario, things aren't improving. The blood pressure falls on the outline to, th to th 30, 20, you've lost the pulse, uh, pulse trace. Um, what do you do? Okay, this, this is a crisis situation. The patient is arrested. I would immediately call for help and announce a crisis to the team. Hmm. The main priorities at this stage are to commence CPR as per the ALS algorithm and apply the defibrillation pads. Mm -hmm. The rhythm is um, sinus tachy tachycardia at the moment at about 150. 
Okay. Um, so he's got a, is a non tropical pathway. Um, so uh, leading this situation, I would allocate roles at this stage for DFib management, CPR, and um, uh, uh, timekeeping, and um, as many helpers on deck to, with drugs, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. Um, <laughs> but given he's on the non tropical pathway, the first priority would be to give adrenaline. Mm -hmm. and to repeat this every other cycle as indicated. Mm -hmm. I would also be asking for the ALS flow chart to share the mental model with the team. And um, I would confer with a senior colleague, mm -hmm. um, just looking for other causes, going through the four H's, the four T's, mm -hmm. um, although likely this is from cement implantation syndrome and the priority is um, fluid and inotropic support. Right. And mm -hmm. I'd be trying to get central access and arterial lines in, in to him at this stage you've already got the outline um yeah everything's yeah. happening you've got the chest compressions going uh you've given adrenaline one milligram for the flush you've also given uh lots of fluid you're trying to treat this cause and the surgeons have stopped what they're doing obviously there's no other bleeding around um you've gone for another two minutes and another two minutes what do you want to do still still an, the patient's still in um uh sinus tachy on the first round uh but yeah. then on the second cycle rhythm check the patient's in vf Okay, so he's now into the shockable pathway. Um, so the priority would be to deliver 200 joules um, biphasic shock. Mm -hmm. um, and to- This, this doesn't result in a change of rhythm after the second, after the third, third rhythm check now. Okay. So this is clearly a difficult situation because um, it's quite well known that cement implantation syndrome can take some time to resolve. Mm -hmm. um, however, this gentleman has an advanced care directive and it was already discussed preoperatively that um, prolonged active resuscitation would not be in his best interests in the event of an arrest. Let's stop there. That's good. So <laughs> I, you, you've been doing really well. So I thought I've just made this up on the spot now. I've just gone, we should have a resuscitation plan. I'm just going to arrest the patient and see what she was, see what she says about it. I just want to I guess put it out there that um, oh my god how difficult would this be because we, yes. you know, when we talk about the modification of the plan i'm not yeah. i'm not expecting that i actually have to call it um so knowing the elephant in the room is that this patient is very in a very bad situation and has this acute resuscitation plan and probably low quality of life how do you go about making this tough call yeah it's, it's not easy um and it certainly shouldn't i don't think it should be done um on an individualized approach mm. so i think with his um in his situation after say 20 minutes there was no no rosk then i would be speaking with the team at this stage to say like this is the situation we um this is a gentleman who's very unwell He's not um, gone into cardiac arrest and has no signs of life on a background of an already pre-morbid um, condition. Yes. Uh, and then I would ask, you know, I would say, I think it's in his interest at this stage to stop. Does anyone have any objections? Yeah. No, and and that's, that's a very familiar format that I've heard many people say. From, from a per personal point of view, I almost... I like what you said about you, you wouldn't take this on individually. Like you, you are sharing this discussion because it's such a tough call and you know, you never want to have to make this call, let alone do it alone. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I would, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd almost want to offload the decision. I'm leading the arrest. I've got to run this, but you know, you, you know, I'd, I'd like to liaise in this decision, but you know, I'd get ICU, get my director, get the chief medical officer. You know, I need lots of people to help me make this, this decision, because it's just, too too difficult just for yeah life. and actually i sometimes think if you you know when people say that it's almost like you're mm. you've already made that decision and to act to, to speak up is mm. you're going against the grain whereas a, perhaps a more open approach would be yeah. does anyone have any strong opinions as to what we should do at this stage yeah, sure. yeah. No, absolutely and it's it's interesting you said that because that that definitely feels like it's a already already stating stating what it is and it, some people have to go against it so yeah having that kind of framework to allow you know, people to 
you know, voice their opinions, but also people not involved to make dispassionate decisions. I mean, when you're in the arrest, doing everything you can, it's so hard to think clearly. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Kind of cognitive overload. Yes, that that was really good. Um, let's let's end the vibe there. How do how do you feel? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thanks thanks for doing that sleep deprived as well. You did really really well. That was great. <laughs> thanks. Sometimes it's a bit easier when you're sleep deprived because. Your frontal yeah. inhibitions have gone. <laughs> <laughs> it's like having a drink, right? Just uh, <laughs> yeah. um, especially that crisis again. I, I liked your format. It reminded me of the format that we went through in this in in our CRM talk. So that, that was, I was I was really pleased with that. Yeah, um, I actually found that um, some of the things you went through so helpful, like I just the, the steps, and um, I've ashamedly copied them. <laughs> no, no, a lot of, a, a lot of people say they like the steps, but I don't actually hear them say. It the way you did, which I obviously, okay. obviously I, I really like because it makes sense to me. So um, I'm very flattered that you've, you know, taken, taken time and effort to actually really learn the things that I've, I've kind of taught. Yeah. But just from, you, you hit all the CRM points as well. Like, you know, I would you know, get the cognitive aids. Um, I would re- confer with a colleague. I'd reassess. I would, you know, all, all those things. My priorities are this and this. So I'd do everything that I'm doing ALS, but also manage these priorities. It, to me, it sounded really sharp. So um, that was really good, and obviously the patient didn't have a good outcome. But that's not a reflection of your, you know your abilities in this survivor. So now, really well done. Thank you. I find it hard to, to get to that level of um, saying enough detail, but also moving on. And I always find with the mm. well, most, certainly with the crisis stuff, that I always forget a few points. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah. I suppose that's just natural. Yeah, and, and also, um, I mean, you, you go through a lot of the detail, you get a lot of detail out and you get it quickly. So it's it's a very different thing if you're saying detail at a very slow pace. The exam uh-huh. wants you to move on. They want to give you marks. They want you to pass. Uh, and so someone who speaks slower wouldn't be able to do what you've done, I think. Uh, okay. So, I think speed makes up for a lot of things. Um, after you, maybe after you said one level of your framework, pausing, seeing yeah. the examiner wants to say something is fine. Like I, I do remember at that time, at that time I wanted to uh, me- mention to you that yeah, yeah, you got the diagnosis, but you did keep going on a bit. Yeah. With the um, other differentials and things. Yeah. Uh, but no, but, that, it, but it, it just wasn't a big deal because you were saying very good, true things. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Really well done. Uh, hey, go thanks. on. I have one more question. Yeah, please. Um, yeah, so when you're listing you really crisis management and you said what you think it is and other important differentials to look for, but then you're saying you want to do a systematic check. Mm-hmm. I, feel, I feel it's lengthy enough just to list what the systematic problems are, but then to go back and say how you check each one is just far too much time. Uh, as in, and that's why I, I think these are the problems. Pause. Yeah. And then maybe you know, if the examiner really wants you to nail down one of them, then they've got the opportunity to say, "Yep, talk about." Okay. That. Uh, how um, would you look for that yeah. particular problem? Like the, the, you know, you mentioned some co- cause of hypoxemia. Look, I'd look for all the causes of you know, F, decrease of I, hyperventilation, shunt, VQ mismatch, and diffusion abnormality. Pause. Okay, I'll go through all of them. Great. <laughs> Turn up. Yeah. The- okay. Uh, ventilate these are all the causes shunt this is how i rule it out um so yeah, yeah you give opportunities for these things to come in but I, I feel like because you cannot ever know what the examiner is thinking you cannot mind read them the only thing we have is structures and a system of communication to make that happen quicker and you know hopefully yeah. getting out of this yeah yeah thanks everyone it's especially faith thanks so much for um, volunteering your time and yeah just to be examined you know live is is can be pretty confronting but you did so well um i'm, I'm very confident you'll do, do well in this exam so but, no, that's all all good and um yeah thanks everyone for listening thank thanks, and <laughs> thanks, thanks very much larry <laughs> no, no problems at all yeah thanks everyone for listening and watching you yeah, know please share this with anyone who might be interested especially if they're sitting there part two exam and uh yeah see everyone see everyone next time